Thank you for joining us for worship here at the Peninsula Churches. Be it Sunday, Monday or Saturday, morning, evening or night, whenever you're joining us, know that you are more than welcome. We come now to worship God. But before we do, let us take a moment just to truly allow ourselves to be here. Let us close our eyes, slow our breathing and still our minds and allow ourselves to have this moment, to be here with God, Emmanuel, tangled, messy, chaotic, jumbled, muddled. We gather in our diversity, creating the kingdom here. Chaotic, disordered, haywire, untidy, topsy-turvy. A rich pattern of relationships with the diversity of God's imagination. Tousled, complex, rumpled, bedraggled, lost and found. In this unique community, the healed and the broken, seekers and believers, saints and sinners, we hold each other and we worship. Amen. Now let us pray. We come to you, our God, for the journey is long. The way we travel is sometimes winding, sometimes guided by missteps, requiring us to work harder, to return to the path you intend. We are grateful you are always welcoming and your grace is beyond measure. We are reassured by stories in our scripture, knowing that even the great heroes of faith made mistakes, lose their way and sin against you. We feel a kinship with them Help us to be honest and true with ourselves and you. As we pause in a moment's stillness 
to speak to you of our regrets and our missteps. As we bring our confessions to you, we're grateful for your all-encompassing forgiveness. Like Abimelech, prevent us from sinning against you. Give us awareness of your presence, helping us to return to you, to keep going with integrity of heart. Send your spirit, and like Paul, let us listen, seeking your will, following the example of Jesus, always in our love of you and others. Our prayer, our worship, our lives, we offer to you our God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 20, reading from verses 1 to 13. Now Abraham moved on from there into the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while he stayed in Gerar, And there Abraham said of his wife Sarah, She is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her. So he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. This is why I did not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all yours will die. Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all his officials, and when he told them all that had happened, they were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should not be done. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What was your reason for doing this? Abraham replied, I said to myself, There is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's household, I said to her, This is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. Amen. Our second reading is from Acts 20, reading from verse 1 to 6. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, 
they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But when her time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. Amen. Let us pray. O loving Lord, may you take my faltering and inadequate words and speak through them, allowing our ears to hear your message and our hearts to be set on fire with love for you. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Have you ever done anything you regret? Said anything you regret? Had thoughts you regret? That last one might be harder to admit to, as nobody can hold you accountable for what goes on inside your head. Or can they? While I may be judging you all wrong, I am guessing that you have probably answered yes to at least one of these questions. Sadly, I have answered yes to all three. I have said, thought and done things that I am not proud of. Things which have kept me awake at night. Things which I wish with all my heart I could undo. I mean, I may sit here looking like a paragon of virtue, but sadly I am not. And the real problem is I often make these mistakes without even thinking. As sometimes my brain to mouth filter just goes on strike and I say things that are hurtful without even meaning to. Okay, I am flawed and maybe one or two of you are. So no judging here, but when it comes to the people of the Bible, you might be forgiven in thinking that they would stand apart from the rest of us. For surely if they are mentioned in its pages, if they are shining examples that we are to follow, then they must be good, God-fearing individuals. Well, interestingly, the truth is, apart from one obvious exception in Jesus, all fell short of God's glory, though, to be true, some slightly more than others. The Bible is full of doubters, adulterers, murderers, prostitutes, liars and thieves, amongst other things. And yet they are all the people God called as his children. Surprisingly, two such individuals who made poor judgment calls were the cornerstones of our faith, which we heard about in today's reading. Abraham and Paul. Yes, even they made mistakes. They said and did the wrong things. Yet God not only forgave them, but enabled them to go on and achieve amazing deeds. So today, we will be using their lives as examples to explore the incredible and comforting truth of God's unfailing forgiveness. Through their stories, we will see how his forgiveness transcends our failures and sins, reaffirming his love and purpose for us. Let us begin by looking at the life of Abraham. Abraham, often called the father of faith, offers profound insights into the nature of God's forgiveness. Despite Abraham's remarkable faith and pivotal role in God's redemptive plan, his life also included moments of doubt, fear and failure. Through these instances, we see how God's forgiveness operates and its significance in the life of a believer. There are several key lessons about God's forgiveness that we can learn from Abraham's life. Firstly, Abraham's journey began with God's promise to make him the father of many nations. Despite Abraham's subsequent failures, such as his deception about Sarah being his sister, which we heard about in our first reading today, God remained faithful to his promise. This illustrates that God's forgiveness is rooted in his unwavering commitment to his promises. Even when we falter, God's promises stand firm and his forgiveness is available to bring us back into alignment with his plan. Abraham's lie about Sarah being his sister was motivated by fear for his own life. Not once, but twice, he misled others to protect himself, endangering Sarah and compromising his integrity. 
Despite these actions, God intervened to protect Sarah and correct the situation, and Abraham was forgiven. This shows that God understands our human frailties and fears and is willing to forgive us when we turn back to him, even when our actions are driven by weakness, even when we do not learn the first time. And all I can say is thank God for that. After each failure, God not only forgave Abraham, but also restored him to his calling. Following the incidents with Abimelech, God reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham and continued to work through him. This demonstrates that God's forgiveness restores us and reaffirms our purpose. It's not merely about absolving past sins, but about renewing our role in God's plan. The story of Abraham's life should reassure us all that God's forgiveness is always available, transforming our failures into opportunities for growth and renewed purpose. It encourages us to trust in God's promise, seeking for his forgiveness when we fall short, and continue to walk in faith, knowing that his grace is sufficient for all our needs. In our second reading today, we met Paul, who was on a journey to Jerusalem. But this was not the only trip Paul ever took. No, he travelled greatly, although his most important voyage was from a persecutor of Christians to one of the most influential of all apostles. A journey which illustrates several key aspects of divine forgiveness that are relevant to our lives even today. Firstly, it shows how God's forgiveness is available to all, regardless of our past sins. For Paul's early life was marked by intense opposition to the fledgling Christian movement. He actively persecuted Christians, approving of the stoning of Stephen and imprisoning many believers. Despite these grievous actions, God's forgiveness was available to Paul. This demonstrates that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. No matter how grave our past sins, God is willing to forgive us if we turn to him with a repentant heart. Secondly, the life of Paul is a wonderful example of how forgiveness leads to transformation. The encounter between Saul and Jesus on the road to Damascus in the book of Acts marks a dramatic transformation. Saul, blinded and humbled, is confronted by Jesus and experiences a profound change. This encounter signifies that forgiveness is not merely about absolving past sins, but also about transforming lives. God's forgiveness brought about a complete turnaround in Paul's life transforming him from a persecutor to a fervent apostle and missionary. If you could do that with Paul, imagine what he can do with us. Thirdly, forgiveness empowers us for God's mission. How, you may be asking. Well, once forgiven, Paul did not simply return to his normal life. He became a tireless advocate for the gospel. His missionary journeys, one which we heard about earlier today, extensive writings and an establishment of numerous churches were direct outcomes of his forgiven and transformed life. This shows that God's forgiveness comes with a purpose. When we are forgiven, we are also called to participate in God's mission, using our experience and newfound faith to spread his love and truth to others. Both Abraham and Paul show us the importance of acknowledging our sins and seeking forgiveness for them. Recognising our mistakes is the first step towards forgiveness. Thankfully, God's forgiveness is not dependent on perfection. Abraham's deception and Paul's poor choices did not disqualify them from God's love and purpose. For God's grace is greater than our sins and his forgiveness is always available, as shown in the following story. There was once a priest in the Philippines. 
he carried a secret burden of sin, a sin he had committed many years before. He had repented, but still had no sense of God's forgiveness. In the church was a woman who claimed to have visions in which she spoke with Christ and he with her. The priest, however, was sceptical. To test her, he said, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin your priest committed while he was in Bible college. The woman agreed. A few days later, the priest asked, well, did Christ visit you in your dreams? Yes, he did, she replied. And did you ask him what sin I committed while in Bible college? Yes. Well, what did he say? The priest asked. He said, I don't remember. I don't remember. And that is what he says about our sins too, once we ask for forgiveness. I don't remember. Abraham, Paul and the priest stories remind us that God's forgiveness is always available, no matter our sins or shortcomings. We are called to acknowledge our mistakes, seek his forgiveness, and then live in the freedom of his grace. If we have not been able to do this before, for whatever reason, today, may we embrace God's unfailing forgiveness and move forward with renewed faith and commitment towards a future which is lighter, brighter, and more joyous without the weight of sin pulling us down. Praise be and Amen. And now we bring our prayers for others and for ourselves. We pray for those like Abraham who are people on the move, people who are aliens in a strange land, people who feel like aliens in a homeland, Make your presence known to them in the hospitality received by strangers. We pray for bold, empathetic leaders in government to make decisions beyond the next few years, to consider the future with hope, making efforts to encourage responsibility of spending while supporting real human need. We recognise the corrupting nature of power and ask for humility and compassion from those in positions of decision-making for others. We pray for the mission of your church across the world. May we be a vibrant part of that vision welcoming diversity and innovation, celebrating our creation and your holy name. Let our worship shout out your love for the world in our communities in varied ways, listening always for your word. Be with us when what we thought was right was not part of your will. Help us to forgive others who we feel have wronged us. May our actions to one another be genuine and truthful, providing kindness to the hurting and strength for those who need help finding you. Be with those who mourn losses and send your grace to the grieving. Allow acceptance of empathy and support and your love to be recognised and felt. Remind us that our worship and our corporate prayer holds us together in love and faith. O oh God, build up this community of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us come now and dedicate our offering. Generous God, we give to you willingly with grateful hearts. Bless these offerings and our very selves
with the work destined for bringing your kingdom to fruition. Inspire us to take journeys that are spirit-led in our communities and beyond, to make your loving presence known to pilgrims in need. And now, Lord, we bring all our prayers together as we say the words that Jesus taught us in whatever version we know best. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. to see and struggle surface everywhere we lay our lives before his sovereignty and pray his peace would find us there Jesus Lord of peace is with us now and will forever be a shepherd king who leads us in to perfect still
Thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Peninsula Churches. Having worshipped together in all our complexity and our differences, may we journey on, united by the love and blessing of the Creator, the Redeemer and the Sustainer. And may the blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you, those you love and those you should love, today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>